Kim Wheatley, you worked in the police force for 16 years and then a print business for 20 and now in a business called Ascentive where you work for three years. Ascentive is a fantastic company which does referral type uh, marketing. You have a lovely attitude to life, a fantastic demeanour and a love and care for your family and everything you do and a respect which flows in the way that you present yourself. So Kim, thank you for joining me today with our interview. And thank you for that introduction, Ashley. <laughs> Sounds good. Right. I'm going to quickly turn the page. So, Kim, tell us what it is that you do. I had a little bit of an introduction there, but tell us what it is that you do and, and why it's so amazing. What do I do? Um, I suppose, essentially, I help business owners have choice, mm -hmm. have freedom. Um, many business owners, or businesses even, get caught up with challenging clients mm. um, you know wouldn't it be nice to have the choice to to have those clients that you really want as opposed to those ones that expect everything how should we say want a premium service on a budget mm. so I, I enable you to have choice and freedom and actually receive referrals into your target market on a consistent basis interesting so in terms of in terms of these referrals um how how would you best go about getting these referrals? Is it going through your already existing clients or would it be to a, a sort of cold market? You know, what's the best way to get a referral? And, and when should you ask for a referral as well? Well, the best way for a referral is firstly, is for you to realise who you want a referral to. You know, there's many people in business that, that believe they can they can do work or provide a service to anyone. Whereas firstly, we need to analyze, well, who's the, who's the best client for us? Who would be the ideal people to, to be referred to? Mm -hmm. And then from that, we then need to look at, you know, not just who else is in business that could refer us or who are our existing clients, but actually there are, there are eight different referral sources, not just one or two. So, you know, we need to then look at our whole network of people our family, our friends, people in business, the sports clubs we belong to, the religious groups, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. And then from those people, identify who are the right people we should be working with to introduce us to our target market. So those eight groups, those eight areas of people which you can get referrals from, they're yep. very much determined based off of what market you want to get into. So, for example, um, so I'm a coach. What would be the best area for me to start focusing on for me to get referrals and for other coaches out there too? Okay. First of all, I'd have to say to you, who's your target market? Well, I can answer that. Um, my target market is mainly business owners um, and entrepreneurs tend to be um, below the age of 30. That's my main target demographic of people. Okay. So the, the next question I would ask you was, who do you think already services those clients? Um, I'd say a fantastic network group called BNI, um, which does a lot of service to those clients. Uh, I'd say um, a lot of new age marketers do a lot of service to those clients. Um, okay. I think perhaps um, business coaches themselves also do a lot of work with those clients. I know Action Coach is a big one out there, which does a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think, you, I think you're going into the role of being very specific then, depending on what, what sector you're in, is for what I'd say. So you've answered your own question. Who would be the people that are best introducers to that market? You just delivered the answer. Interesting. <laughs> the only slight advocate I would put on it is, you know, you, you mentioned BNI, which for anyone listening to this is, is a huge um, networking group. Um, Obviously, we've all got different target markets. So you should also, when you're looking to join a network, ask yourself a couple of questions. One question being, is my target market in the room? And if they're not, the second question being, are my introducers to that target market in the room? Mm. Because then they're the, they're the two options that actually make that networking group um, a good possibility for you, if the answer to, is yes to either of those questions. 
Now, many people go networking for networking's sake and waste an awful lot of time. But the truth is, you know, with a bit of analysis, we can identify where we should network. How would you say is the best to go about vetting the best networking groups for you? Because you've said it yourself, you know, you, you don't want to spend an awful lot of time um, going to a networking group for networking's sake and making a lot of really nice friends, but no business being transferred between the people. So how, how would you vet um, a networking group, maybe in the first couple of meetings that you have with them to see if they're the right people for you? Well, let's start before then. Before that, I would, I would actually, you know, Google and the internet are a wonderful um, resource. So I, I'd look at the, um, the background of the group, whoever it was. I'd find out as much as I can about it online. Who are their target market? Who are the people that are members? Um, how often do they meet? What, what, what's their ethos? What's their, do their morals, does their, their ethics, do they align with mine? Mm. That's firstly. Then secondly, obviously, once they pass that test, I then need to visit. So I need to visit because, you know, although um, there's some large organisations, every individual group has its own character, its own energy. So that has to fit with me as well. And then once I've visited and I still like it, I need to then try and gauge, well, what, what are the, um, what do other people within this group, what do they feel about the group? So for me, I'd be phoning some individuals up afterwards. Just asking you, hi, Ashley, I see you, saw you this morning in the, um, the meeting. It was nice to see you. Um, can I ask you how long you've been part of it? How did you find it? Mm. Have you had much out of it? Are you looking forward to getting much out of it? Are you positive about moving forward? You know, all those sorts of questions, three or four people, just to give me an understanding, of, am I joining or am I thinking of joining the right network? So it's definitely all about doing the research beforehand and then being brave enough to ask the questions to people already there to see if you get that feel. Hundred um, percent. You know, for me, it's you know, they who whatever network it is, providing I'm of decent character and I've got a decent business, will want me to be part of it. Yeah. So really, I, I have the power. I have the power to. I'm looking to join something, but I have the power to decide which. So I want to get it right. I want. It's down to me to do my own research and make sure it is the right room for me. Yeah. I think um, it's a spot. I think it's a it's a BNI say something like um, you need to find the right room and the right people, or something like that. I can't quite remember the saying, but I I know from personal experience that you really really have to go to, to a few different networking groups in order to find a place that works best for you, and don't always stop with the first one that you go to, because especially if you're brand new to networking. There are so many different groups out there and so many different ways in which you can, you can network that to stop at one is a real disservice to yourself because not one, not one group is the same. And, and I know you can go to different BNI groups, which are totally different to each other. And I've seen them and it's, some of them are just parallels apart. And yeah. you wouldn't think that from a franchise, but no, it, it's the case. Um, yeah. So well, I think so. It, it depends on your own personality because yeah. these networking groups are different sizes, different energy. And for me, um, it, it's not definitive, but a rule of thumb would be, you know, if I'm experienced in business and I'm confident, I want to join a smaller group where I can actually have some influence on how we grow. Um, I can perhaps play a bigger part in, and become a, a um, a big player in the room and be seen as somebody of um, standing. Whereas if I'm younger in business and new and maybe a bit quieter at that point, and I'm generalizing here because we're not all quiet when we're young, obviously. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Quite often it takes a little while for us to, to <laughs> step into our shoes. Yeah. I might want to join a slightly bigger group where I can, um, you know, there's, there's referrals in the room and I'm still new in business. I'm finding my feet so I can, you know, I can already be amongst people that are established and learn from them. 
it's about my own character because it's flip sides you know you you can join a small group and you as even as a young person and relatively inexperienced can grow with the room mm. as well so it, it's our own personalities you know if i'm tired and timid and, and um i don't want to be going in a room with a hundred business owners and get up and speak because i'm going to be shaking my boots yeah. that's not going to be the right room but if i'm an extrovert and i'm out there and i'm happy why not yeah i think you're right personality plays such a big part um recently i've got really interested in personality types and um, the myers-briggs personality test that people the 16th personality type um and i think that if you're introverted uh especially introverted it's really hard for you to go out there and do networking but now is actually the perfect time to do it because you can just do it from home and as long as you're able to sit at your computer and speak for 45 seconds to 60 seconds and then you can turn your camera off again and then you can just you know, let it happen and then if you're then able to sort of maybe find a couple of personal connections from, from a couple of meetings and then work with those people in particular then you might be able to get business even if you're introverted um, yeah I, I do believe though that extroverts are always going to be a bit more uh, prone to getting the most of the networks because yeah. they're extroverted. They love to talk. They love to yeah. talk. So what would be? There's, there's a few things you say there, really, because um, you know we. It's never been easier to network than now. You can sit at home like we are. Or yeah. in the office, you know, and you can have a chat. You can you can have your pajamas on underneath, your shirt and tie at the top, and you can speak and just for your little bit of period and do what you want outside. Never been easier. You've got another I camera on me, Kim. Are you? Are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you're not fine at the moment, don't <laughs> <no> worry. <laughs> but you know what? I remember someone saying to me, um, you know, when we're kids, what did your parents say to you? Don't talk to strangers. Now you get in business and in normal times, what you expected to do, go and network and talk to strangers. Mm. It, it's not something where, you know, we're brought up to do. It's not, you know, we, we have to learn. It's a skill yeah. that many of us learn. So mm. it, it, it's, it's definitely something that sometimes puts us out of our comfort zone. But once we get used to it, it's a great way to do business. But just one thing about networks to remember is nobody goes to a network to buy. And no, so if you're going there to sell, I doubt whether that's going to happen. It's about, about cultivating relationships. It's not about hunting for business. Yes. I think that's something people do need to remember. It is about cultivating relationships with people and I've learned as I've gone on that you need at least um, 14 touch points with people before they'll start to do business with you. You have 14 points of connection to build up that trust. Yeah. Um, I know personally for me, being as it's a, it's a bit of a high ticket item that I sell, that I need at least seven hours with people, seven hours of communication, of contact. Uh, not all in one go, obviously, but yeah. seven hours of communication. Um, <laughs> to create something which really works for them. For me to truly, truly understand what it is that they're after and that they want, and that we can build that sort of level of understanding and commitment. So back on to the introvert and extroverted, what advice would you give to someone who's introverted about attending these meetings, about how, how they can get the most out of it? I think, you know, the first thing is, if, you're, if we're talking in normal times where we're physically attending, Mm -hmm. um, where you have control of what you do more. Um, I would just make a point of speaking to as many people as I could and finding out about them rather than me. Mm -hmm. I would just, um, you know, say, oh, hi, I'm Kim. Um, what's your name? And what do you do, Ashley? Oh, how's business at the moment? Where do you operate? How do you get most of your new clients? interesting da, 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 da. just questions about you and most nine out of ten if not more people will eventually ask about me but the more i seem interested in you and i would be interested i say seem but i would be interested um the more relaxed the whole the whole thing becomes 
It's when we go there and we think, oh, I'm selling myself, mm -hmm. selling my services here, because they might want to buy what I've got to offer, which would be highly you know, unusual from a first meeting. Um, but just to go there to learn about other people. That makes life so much easier and takes the focus off of you. Yeah. I had a, a great interview with um, another BNI called James Bennett, and he's, he's an excellent salesman, 35 years plus experience, phenomenal what he does. And one of the first things he said during the interview was, if you're thinking about selling, stop. Or <laughs> if you're trying to sell, don't. Because yeah. trying to sell and doing things which you think are selling type things just deters people. They don't want to, don't want to talk to you. Mm. People want to do business with those that they know, like, and trust. And more importantly, trust. Trust is going to be a big one. And how, how do you think we can build trust in a networking way? Is it just showing up and being consistent or is there another, is there another way to do it? It's part, part of it. You know, there's a number of things. Trust is probably, you know, when I train, I, I have something I call five referral steps. Mm -hmm. And the biggest step, because they're at different heights, is the first step, which is trust. Now, trust can take a while to build up and it, and it, it comes from various elements. So if you're talking about in a networking situation, you know, if I consistently turn up late, the trust element is damaged. Mm. You know, had had I, which I don't, by the way, but I'm just making it up. If, had I had, I don't know, connections with Richard Branson, and somebody says to me, I want an introduction to Richard Branson because I could do X, Y, and Z, but they turn up late three out of every four weeks, they're never going to get that introduction because I wouldn't put my reputation at stake for Richard Branson phoning up. You said Bob will be here at nine, and it's our past, and he's not here. So firstly, it's about timekeeping. It's about how we look. Do we look appropriate to the people we're asking to be introduced to? So I'm not saying everybody should be wearing a suit. What I'm saying is we need to look appropriate for the clients we're asking to be introduced to. Do, do we say or do we do what we say we're going to do? Or do we let people down? Mm. Do we forget meetings? Do we forget things? Do, do we act like we, we would like to be seen? So, you know, numerous people talk a good game, but when it actually comes out, some, sometimes they disappoint us. So here it's about not disappointing people. Um, it's about, it's, there's a saying that's been out there for a while, and it, for me it's slightly wrong. It, what it says is, treat others how you would like to be treated. Now, any idea what's wrong with that? Go on, Kim. You tell me. Okay. <laughs> Why don't I treat you how you would like to be treated? Because you would like to be treated differently than me. Right. We're all different personalities. So I have to gauge in the first few sentences, what sort of person are you? Are you a loud person? You're a quiet person? Are you well spoken? Do you f and blind a lot? Do you do everything about? So I almost with you know we've all got various things within our own personalities where we can go to different levels. So I can almost to a point not completely mimic you, but I can come more to how you're used to being spoken to and what makes you feel comfortable. Mm. It wouldn't be about me speaking to you how I feel comfortable if you're a completely different personality. Mm. So the important phrase is speak to others how they would like to be spoken to or treat others how they would like to be treated. That's quite powerful. And, and that also helps with the trust because we're building up, you know, the, the, I, I, I'm not an NL, NLP trainer or anything like that, but part of it is about mimicking things as well in people. So the more we can, we can build up similarities, we, we create a bonding. Mm -hmm. Talk me through um, the other four steps on this five referral steps. So trust is number one. So if trust is number one. So let, let's say I'm, I'm talking to you and I'm thinking, well, you're going to refer me to some people. OK, so I need to build up something here. So trust would be number one. So we built the trust. You trust me. We've, we've, we've got a level of understanding where you'd be happy to try and help me. 
So the next thing you need, you, you would need some basic business knowledge. So you'd need some business knowledge about, well, who do, who do I serve? Who gets benefit from my service? Um, where am I based? Geographically, how can I help people? Am I, am I limited or is there a particular area? Um, the name of my company. Um, maybe how long I've been doing it. You know, just something that you can, you can speak about, you know, four, four minutes, just about me. If somebody starts, like, there'd no, be, be no point, actually, if you started to introduce, oh, I know this great business coach called Kim. And they go, oh, what's the name of his company? Um, um, and where's he based? Um, um, everything goes to pot. Yeah. So it's just some basic business knowledge. Okay, so that'd be the second step. For me, the third step is about, and a very important step, identifying the need. So identifying the need for somebody's service. So what do you need to either see or hear that all of a sudden you think, ah, there's an opportunity for Kim here. So, you know, do you, do you need to hear that, just using us as examples again, do you need to hear that they're struggling um, with challenging clients, you know, they, they, they're, they're too busy yet. They still want to grow. So how's that going to work? You know, all these sort of things I would need to, to at least give you the ideas for that. And then once, um, you know, I've, I've pointed you in the right direction of what to look out for or listen for the next step, which is where an awful lot of referrals are not done correctly in my humble opinion would be offering the person as the solution. What you'll, you'll find in many, in many cases, it'll be, we get excited. Oh, oh it, it, yeah, oh, I can see how Kim can um, help this person. Oh, I'll tell you what, I'll get Kim to give you a call this afternoon. And that's the end of it. What, what we've not done is firstly clarified the need completely because we don't know if they're ready to take action. Do they have finances to invest? Secondly, a much better introduction would be, okay, tell me more about what you're looking for. Tell me more about what you need to achieve. Tell me more about your time frame when you're looking to do this. Okay, interesting. I'll tell you what, I've got a friend I've known for a while now. His name's Kim. And I'll keep using him as an example, but I'm just trying to make it easy. His name's Kim. He does exactly what you're looking for. And in fairness, I've introduced him a couple of times to people with exactly the same problems or challenges as you. And every single one of them has given me fantastic feedback on what's, what he has done for their business and what great value it's at. Does he sound like the sort of expert that you'd like to speak to? Totally different way of putting it. Totally different way of presenting. Yeah. I've, I've presi I wish actually I didn't use me, I'd use somebody else now as an example, but I've positioned the person, <laughs> I've positioned the person as somebody, you know, oh yeah, I'd love to actually speak to them. You know, they can help me. They've done what you know, with other people and all this sort of stuff. And, and so that's the fourth step. And the final step, and especially with those people that you really trust, is showing what an appointment looks like for you. So for argument's sake, you know, I've got a friend who's a financial advisor and I could say to you, if I was introducing you to him, okay, um, I'm seeing Dave this afternoon. I'll, I'll get him to call you, Ashley, this afternoon. What he'll do, he'll make an appointment with you to come and see him in, over the next couple of days. You'll turn up at his house, which has got two double gates, electronic gates, and you have to press the buzzer. Give it a moment after pressing the buzzer because you've got two dogs and he normally puts them away in a room because he knows not everybody likes the dogs. But he will get there and he'll let you in and you'll come in. You'll go through to his study. He'll offer you a cup of tea and he'll get out the ginger snaps because they're his favourite biscuit, by the way. <laughs> and then he'll spend about an hour or so with you just finding out about your investment, what you know, your risk, what sort of risk, what you want to achieve, what outcome you're looking for over what time frame, etc. Um, and then after an hour, you, you'll, you'll go away and he'll call you again within about 48 hours to get you back in again for another hour's meeting. Well, he'll run through with what opportunities um, he's found for you and to see that that fits comfortably with, your, um, with what you're looking for. How does that sound? Yes, much better. Does it sound like I know him? It does. It absolutely does. 
And if, it, if we really had a relationship that where referrals were flowing freely, he might once a month or even once a week, give me a Friday afternoon to fill his calendar for him. <laughs> yeah, literally. So he might say, well, Kim, afternoon, I, I like uh, an hour and a half in between each meeting. So on every last Friday, if you want to put three or four people in, feel free. That's open for you. How, how powerful would you say that these referrals are in this way of marketing? And, and how, much, how much money would you say that, on average, someone that does your course or does your training creates via referral marketing after they've completed it with you, say in the first year or two? Okay, I, I think, well, firstly, in terms of you said the power behind it, etc. cetera, yeah. it, done like that, um, obviously there are the occasional people where we just, they just don't like us, something happens, but that's rare. So those sort of people won't buy from us. But a couple of things happen. First, your actual likelihood of getting the job increases numerous times. Price becomes less of an issue. Price is always an issue, it's in a band, but as long as you're in their price band, you're okay. Yeah. Obviously there is the odd person out there that's only price based, but you're, you're losing a lot of that. You're actually gaining value to your service because they want it, their um, problem solved. Um, secondly, in terms of people working with me and what they get out of it, I don't put it in monetary terms because I have some businesses that turn over a lot and I have other people working with me that don't turn over a lot. But what I put it is in percentage terms mm -hmm. that you should at least be doubling the amount of business you get by the way of referral with working with me within 12 months. Wow. Mm. So I mean, um, printing businesses tend to do really well in networks because everyone yeah. needs, everyone needs a printer. So I suppose if you're getting a hundred odd referrals every three months, um, and you're doubling that, then that's, that's a lot. That's a hell of a lot, in fact. Um, well, it, what you said there I, I, is a double-edged sword, really, because printing services, when you say get a lot, they get a lot of referrals. Yes. What they don't get a lot of, generally, I'm generalising, is high-ticket stuff. Right. So they, they'll get a lot of referrals for business cards, which cost, I don't know, 40 quid, 50 quid. But you need a hell of a lot of them to make it pay. However quite easy by working with someone like me we'd look to ask for different introductions we look for higher ticket stuff we look at your target market which would evolve all around that um, so immediately there's opportunities without even getting any more introductions in fact you could probably get a lot less but earn a lot more out of it interesting so would you say that the referral based way of doing things works best with high ticket items and is there a special way of, of referral marketing that's going to work more so for high ticket items than what would be for low ticket or high ticket services as well well not really because it depends depends on what you want so uh, you know i've got um a client at the moment she has a health clinic so, you know, one of the services she does is, is around injuries and, and bones and spinal stuff. And, and I think um, it's £45 a session. Mm -hmm. That's not a high ticket item. However, by us looking at the way she does her business, which generally is people coming to her, we're now looking at, um, well, who in business needs her services? And one of the people we've come up with is dentists. So dental practices, numerously, they're, they're always leaning over all the time. And people, so nearly every dentist, if they've been doing it for a, a period of time, ends up with eight backache, etc. Mm -hmm. So we can increase the number of referrals and fill her calendar up. But we can also then look at different ways for her to market. Can she add on a video series of maintenance exercises that people pay a small subscription fee to? How, how is she going to get to a target market that she decides is a target market? So she, she has same opportunities depending on what she wants. Mm -hmm. However, if you're selling, I don't know, double glazing windows, obviously £8,000 a house or, what, or more, um, then obviously that you're going to get a higher value out of it, but you've got bigger costs. 
just thinking as well, hairdressers have really bad back problems as well. Exactly the same yeah. boat. Really, really poor. Um, not at the moment, but not in normal yeah. time they would, yes. No. They'd be relieving. Yeah. Hairdressers are going to grow at least by two inches during this time because the spines are just going to decompress. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't you see by mine? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, you mentioned there about um, more the business coaching aspect. So I know that um, you mainly tailor in, in the referral marketing, which is just so incredibly interesting. But in terms of the business coaching, what would you say is the biggest mistake people make in their businesses um, when they're just starting out? Uh, do you think people miss a trick in some way or something you keep coming across? What, what do you think? There's a high percentage of business owners um, that just end up in business. So, how should I say, we may be, may be made redundant. Mm. So they're looking for a business to get involved in. Or they, they may, I don't know, could be an electrician that's working for a firm. The firm goes bust. So all of a sudden I end up starting up my own business. Or, uh, you know, I've got a passion for wood carving. So I'll start up a wood carving business. So we, we're often good at what we do physically. But we're not good at, well, I say not good, we've not been taught to be good at going and getting the business. And it, two things either happen. Either we struggle getting the business originally because we don't know how to go to market. So, you know, we've got to have some money behind us if we've got premises, etc. Or we're quite lucky and we get a load of business, but we don't have stuff in place to handle it. We don't have processes. We don't, you know, we're letting people down. We're not on time to all our jobs and we're not returning the calls. We're not answering the emails because we just got so busy working in the business. So it's about how do we manage the growth of our business? And understandably, a lot, a lot of new people straight into business um, you know, have, have high hopes which is fantastic, but they can often in the first couple of years get them knocked out of them. Where, you know, after two years, we look back at our business and think, this has not happened how I, I expected it. I've not got the business I want, or I've got miles to, or it's more normally that side, but you do get, I'm making it up now, but 20% where they've got miles too much and they've burnt a lot of their contacts then because they haven't been able to service them. So we, we need to look at, you know, firstly going to market, who do we market to? How are we going to go to market? What's the best way to service them? And if we are getting busy, now let's put some processes in place. What can happen? You know, when you first, I remember 20 odd years ago when I first started the business, somebody phoned me up trying to sell me something. And she said on the phone, can I speak up to the managing director? I said, speak him. She went, that's lucky. I don't normally get straight through to her. So I said, in fairness, if you said, can I speak to the tea boy? I would have still said, speaking, because I do everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, what, <laughs> but that's most people when they first start business. Not everybody, because some of us have got money behind us and things, but most of us. The point being that as we grow, we should look to, and, and commerce allows us, we should look to employ people in the areas that are not our forte. And that relieves pressure from us so we can grow with processes in place. Mm. So, you know, if, I, if I'm not good with my diary um, and, and appointments and all that, so why don't I get a virtual assistant to help me with that, a PA or some sort or, or whatever. If I'm not good at social media and I, and I want to utilise social media, why don't I, um, with my input, employ an agency to do do that for me you know it's it's about rather than trying to do everything try and offload those ones that we're not so good at and focus more where we are good and that way we can grow and keep the business running smoothly and pro we're looking on the business as opposed to in it i think that's absolutely spot on because i think a lot of people they have this decision especially self-development they have this decision where they can either work on their weaknesses and become a well-rounded, robust, strong individual, 
or they can absolutely double down on their strengths and become a, a heat-seeking missile um, and become extremely good, if not the best, at what it is that they do. And the arg there's, there's arguments, too, from, for both. I think it depends on your personality. So, for example, my personality type, I'm extremely good at logical, long-term thinking. I'm not very good at the emotional side of things. So I'm not very good at talking to someone emotionally, but I'm very good at telling them what it is that they need to do logically to get to where they need to be in the next step, the next one, the next one, the next one, etc. So for me, I know that I need to double down because I can, I can get a personal assistant for the emotional stuff. I can refer, I can defer to that sort of thing. I think a lot of business owners at the beginning probably do need to do an awful lot because they don't have the money. They need to do everything or the need to get help to do it for, for cheap. So I'd say for those people that you're absolutely right. If, if you can refer and defer things to other people, do it because you're going to get so much more time to do the thing that you actually care about and actually love. Um, and unfortunately with that, you know, and, and, I, and I was one of those people too. And I think many of us, because we're running our own business are a bit like this, is that le letting something go for somebody else to do, um it's an issue yeah. it's a problem because we want it's our business we're trying to overlook all the time and you know they don't do it quite like we do it <laughs> having said that they might do it better yes <laughs> but they're not doing it like we did it you know but it is a pro i find it an awful lot with business owners so we um and it's not everybody by any stretch but there is a lot of us that um you know we struggle letting go of the reins a little bit it's like our children it's you know we struggle letting go and letting letting that person get on with it. Yeah. How would you say to? Would you? How, what would advice would you give to someone to try and handle that? Obviously not with kids, but with the business. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would say, you know, firstly, well, you you can um, you've got to have a conversation with the person. You're. It depends whether they're in house as well or out. So if you're outsourcing, um, you've got to have a conversation with the person. You've, you've got also, and the conversation for me would be something along the lines of, you know, I'm not used to not doing this. I normally do it. So it's the first time I, I realise I should employ an agency that can do it better. Uh, um, but I would like some input, especially for the first few months. And we can, on a sliding scale. So, you know, I gradually release it over to you um, when I'm extremely comfortable with what's going on. That'd probably work for them and for you because it's a slow progression. The advocate I would put, and anybody outsourcing social media um, would be for me, social media is never quite the same if it doesn't have your own personality stamp on it. So even though you're outsourcing to uh, an agency, make sure you still have a lot of input into what they're doing. Um, don't completely take hands off and just let them get on with it. Um, at least have some sort of input rather than a generic stuff going out there. But it could be anything. It could be, you know, even if it's your diary, you've got somebody handling your diary. It could be a month where you release it, you know, week by week, and you're just checking that, so you're entering it like, okay, I see what you're doing now. Uh, okay, you put, then you're logging it into my Google Calendar. All oh, right, got that. I mean, it could be whatever. I mean, I know I'm making it very really simple. But it can be a gradual handover. And that would be good for them, but also good for you. Mm. So it's to do it gradually, not to rush into things too fast. And I think, yeah. it, again, it turns on personality. Some people really love the, um, let's just do it now, do it quickly, let's, let's just go, I need to do other things. And other people might take two months or three months for it to actually happen because mm. it, it takes them that long to trust. What, what's your experience on your journey? Because, you know, you, you've done an awful lot, you know, a police officer, um, running your own business in, in printing and then obviously we're in this one in marketing what what's your experience what words of wisdom or pearls of wisdom do you have to give which you think would, would be really really beneficial for people no matter what the hell on the ruin their business for pearls of wisdom I, I think you probably put me on a bit of a pedestal they're expected too much um, oh, hey i know how experienced you are kim i know how amazing you are <laughs> I, you just, you just put yourself too low. That's the problem. <laughs> I think, okay. I think 
you know, in business, business can be a lonely place. You're the person at the top if you're the owner. I know there's various sizes of business out there, but if we're talking, um, you know, smaller type business, um, then, then you're the owner, even if you're employing 25 people, it, it, it can be a lonely place. You're making the decisions. And I've, I've got a saying, who motivates the motivator? Because we all have down days or tough days. And um, when you're the business owner, you, you, you're trying to, to motivate everybody else all the time. So if you've lost your motivation, and, and, and in fairness, definitely I know a number of people that did through this period, this isolation period, where they worried about their businesses. But one way to keep yourself on track all the time is go back to your vision. What is your vision for your company and, and your goals? Now, goals and vision are slightly different. Goals are set targets, visions are aspirations. So for me, go back to, you know, why are you doing this? Why have you set, what, where do you want your company to be and you to be and your family to be in a certain period of time, it's three or five years. So it's important you get that on paper so it's physically there for you to refer back to in those times when things go a little bit astray, a little bit awry for you. Some challenges happen. And it's a thing, the bigger your vision or the bigger your goals, um, well, actually, the smaller, let's put it the other way, the smaller your goals, there's going to be hurdles that get in the way. And the smaller your goal, those hurdles become complete blocks, complete barriers. The bigger your goal, those people with big goals, they find ways to get around them or over them or through them. Very different. But you, it's one way to keep you on track all the time. What was my purpose for starting this business in the first place? What am I trying to achieve with it? And that's for the business, but it's also ultimately for you and your family. That's what I would say. Make sure you have your vision and your goals in place so that you can continually refer back to them. 100% agree with what you said there about her, if it's small goals, they're going to be blocks. If it's big goals, it's going to be hurdles and, you know, little, little hills. And something one of my good friend of mine, David, um, David Hayner said, he's a great public speaker. He said that um, some people in life, it's like a pendulum where if you have living trivial, trivial goals and, and trivial life, it's like this, you know, you, you never, and there's no real pain there. It's just like this. Whereas if you're living a really big, big goal life, it's really, really good. And it swings all the way back again. It goes really, really, really bad. But then again, it swings back. And it's really, really good. And it's this pendulum life where it can be amazing because you've got a big goal. Then when the hard times come, they hit really hard. But if you can survive the hard times you're going to really flourish in the times where it's going really, really well. And I don't think anything describes a business owner more than that pendulum, especially someone with a, with a big goal in their mind. And I'm sure you've experienced exactly the same thing. Yeah. And, and more so actually over these last three months, because it, you could, um, if you look at businesses today with, you know, in, in isolation and COVID-19, everybody, not everybody, most of us, when we initially realized we were going into isolation, if we were in business, had a small panic. Some had a big panic. <laughs> okay. Some of us, it would have been five minutes. Some of us are still in it. Okay. The, the interesting part is that more people become, or more creative ideas come out of challenging times than when the times are good. When the times are good, we're on the hamster wheel. And we just keep going through the same processes that we do every single day. And we continue in that path until something happens and goes wrong. When times become challenging, we start to think outside the box and become creative with our ideas. So you look now, some people after a few weeks, they, they started to learn to survive and they're actually thriving now, some people in business. You know, they've found new ways to market. They've embraced online stuff. Um, not that, not that restaurants and that are, are thriving, but some of them have found ways to at least survive 
by doing home deliveries. You know, Sunday dinners and things are happening in this area and things. People are delivering alcohol, you know, bars and things where they, they're doing stuff online now that they weren't doing before. Um, some people are, are, are just finding new markets around COVID. Like, you know, I've got a, um, a guy that um, he does vehicle signage, graphics and things. Well, he, he's now gone into the realms of COVID-19 stuff and stickers and compliance stuff. Um, so it's just about thinking outside the box sometimes in challenging times. For most of us, I appreciate there are some people out there where it is extremely difficult. Uh, but for definitely a significant portion of us, we've, we've managed to adapt and, and find a way to survive. And as I say, few of us are, are absolutely thriving. Yeah, you're right. Um, I know for me and my business, I'm doing better now during COVID than whatever I was doing beforehand, which is crazy to think about. Um, but I, when, I, when this happened, I lost a few clients, which I think people panic, as you say, people are still in it. But now that we're adjusted to the new normal and I've changed my strategy and then I have more time, I'm able to speak to people like you and reach out and to, and to learn more make more connections um it's got better and you're thinking you know it's really weird because talking about a recession which is definitely going to come mm -hmm. but if the businesses which do well and that thrive can survive in this climate you know the recession is going to end probably within you know at the end of 21 2021 or 2022 that's mm -hmm. going to go crazy absolutely crazy in fact one one speaker that I know called Dan Penner, he says that we're not, it's going to be a collapse unlike anything we've seen ever. The only comparable thing is going to be end of World War II. That's going to be the level it's going to be. And we're just waiting right now. But if you can survive this, there's going to be big opportunities that's going to come up. Massive opportunities. And I don't know if you've thought about it, but you know, do you, have you, can you see any opportunities coming on the horizon in any particular area? Or it's you know I've, I'm I'm no uh, expert in money matters, but they do say in, in when things go wrong, there's more millionaires made coming out of it than uh, you know the opportunities there for for huge growth. And and I suspect it will be the usual markets at that time, like like property and and investment stuff and shares. But it's about doing buying them at the right time, which I'm not an expert in, but. I think for us in business at the moment, the two major things, even when, it, you know, if, if, which it probably is, as they, they seem to predict, this recession is, is going to be deep, is how we adapt, because we may have to adapt, and we are adapting at the moment, but those are the five, and also going back to your mindset. You know, there, there are still people out there in business that are still stuck in a hole, and woe is me. And, you know, some of those people, there would have been opportunities to adapt that they've missed. I perfectly accept there's some markets in the hospitality arena and travel that are particularly challenging. Um, but for many of us, there would have been opportunities out there to adapt. And, and we're going to have to find them. We're going to have to adapt if we want to survive. We're going to have to find our market. Um, that would be my advice. Don't, don't do what you always did. Because what you always did might not work anymore. Yes. Yeah, spot on. What would you say is the best advice for the mindset at the moment in terms of it, what's going on? Because, you know, it's only going to get worse. It's going to be a different kind of worse, but it's going to get worse. So what would you say to people who are struggling with mindset right now? Why, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you in business? Why did you get into business? That, that shouldn't have changed. You know, what, what are you trying to, what did you originally want to achieve with your business? That quite possibly hasn't changed. The only thing that might have changed is the time frame. Your actual, you know, so you might have to reassess your, your depending on how long a recession is, but reassess your goals. So they might have to, you know, you know, you know turning over, £250,000 might not be realistic in the next year that you, you thought it was. You might have to come down a bit. But your actual end goal shouldn't, shouldn't change. So just keep reminding you why you're, why you're in this. 
Now, is it, is it for your family? And when I say, is it for your family, I don't just mean to buy a bigger house and a, you know, a nicer car, but really what? What is it? What do you want to do with your family? Physically, what is it you're looking forward to? Is it, oh, well, I'm looking for a bit more time off so I can spend them, you know, doing this, that, and that. Okay, so it's time. It's not actually family. It's quality time with the family. It's not the actual bigger house. It's quality time. So let, let's, let's look at that. So remind, it's always a constant reminder, well, why am I doing this in the first place? Something we've spoken about is what success looks like for people. And, you know, we're, we're at different parts of our journey now. And mm -hmm. my success is going to look extremely different to your success. And yeah. I think it's so often missed that I'm, I want success. People don't question it and go, well, what does it look like to you? Um, mm -hmm. And it, I think it also depends on how, how big people shoot. You know, if, mm -hmm. if you're shooting for those big, massive goals, then you're definitely going to have to suffer for a lot longer than if you're shooting for, for you know, for, for in a comparison, a smaller goal. And mm -hmm. it just depends on where you are on your journey too. Mm -hmm. I, I like the way you put that to me, that um, we're at different ends. <laughs> 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 well, we, you know, we, <laughs> that was no, that's absolutely fine. I liked it a lot. But you, you've brought up a very, very interesting point. So, you know, many clients I work with, and I say, so what do you want to achieve? Well, I want to be successful. So my first question, as you've just alluded to, because I know we've spoke about this before, is well, what is successful? What because success to you is very different to me. And then I'll have some people to say, well, I want to, I don't know, turn over a million pound. Okay. Why? Yeah. Why do you want to turn over a million pound? And it becomes normally, it's, it's a journey we go through of questioning, which has happened numerous times where they go, well, so I can have the nicer car, the bigger house, blah, blah, blah. But it's always something else. When you actually nail it down, it's always something else. It's hardly ever about the money. Yeah, you know, some people's success will be because um, their idea of success will be a drive because they failed at something earlier. That, that may not be a major issue to you, but to them, it's a big thing. So we need to work out. Okay, so what what does it mean? When when will that be? You know, you'll be okay with this. So what do you need to achieve to be okay with this? Now, some people's it's about recognition. Some people it's about, you know, like, you know, with me, my, mine's all about time. We're not on earth long enough. So I have a drive to help business owners um, spend time more effectively with the people they love and less time actually physically in the business. So why do we do what we do is so important to us feeling successful. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, and again, uh, I hear this all the time. You know, some people, young people, will say, "I want to build the empire." You know, I want to, I want to do this and this and this, and then I want to walk away and then, I, you know, sell it or do whatever, do whatever, do whatever. And you know, I, I love everyone's goal as long as it's truly what it is that they want and that they're truly dedicated to it. And you will know this better than better than a lot of people, but. I can imagine during those first year or two of making a printing business, but it was hard, but it was hard graft, hard work. And you know, what, what's that like? Because some people are going to listen to this and they're not going to, they're not going to have to have worked like how uh, self-employed business owners have worked. So what's that like? What was that like for you to graft? Okay. Um, my printing business, I originally, when I started it, I, I had a, um, a street premises so it was open to the public um, I <laughs> got very excited and this is a long time ago now opened the doors with balloons and a fanfare and expected the hordes to rush in <laughs> uh, other than the first day we loads of family and friends came for the champagne and the balloons and a bit of cake etc the next day was dire I think I had two people coming and, and you know, uh, and, and that went on for a while. And I thought to myself, what the blazes have I done here? I just thought the world was waiting for me in my print business. Obviously I was wrong. Um, so it, it took a while for me to 
in fairness, it probably took a couple of years for me to gradually spend a lot of money, wasting a lot of money on different forms of advertising, different people that, that, that were attempting to sell me the, um, the next shiny thing. So if you do this, you're going to get loads of business. If you spend this with us, you're going to get loads of business. Um, and I have to say, none of them worked. None of them. But I spent a lot of money. But it was a gradual process of me learning what did work and what didn't. And I, um, I would say, be very careful before you invest in the next shiny thing that you think is going to turn your business into a gold mine overnight because unless you're extremely lucky and there is the odd person out there but unless you're extremely lucky it takes longer than there's, there's no magic bullet i think a lot of business owners are exactly the same way i know i was mm. i was exactly the same way i started but People are going to rush to me. You know, I've got my website up and I thought, this is it. They're going to, Google, they're going to know to Google my name. They're going, to, they're going to know to Google my name and they're going to type it in and go, wow. And I thought I was going to get people in. And the first mm. month rolled in, no one. The second month, no one. The third, fourth, sit, you know. I thought, ah, okay. Mm. <laughs> Clearly, yeah. I've, I've missed something here. Um, and well, I think the, the truth is that you know, are there other people in the world that do what we do? Absolutely. Absolutely. So why, sh and don't get me wrong, I'm not proper because I'm exactly the same. Yeah. It's human nature. But why should we think as soon as we start our business, everybody's going to leave the other people they're using and come to us? Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. It, it's a nice um, positive attitude to have. But when you actually analyze it, it doesn't make sense unless we have something totally unique which is very rare. So, so we, we have to learn how, to, how do we position ourselves differently? What is the benefit of using our services as opposed to somebody else's? Mm. So it, it, it's, a, um, it's a learning curve that we, we need to develop into how, how we position ourselves, as I say, slightly different than our competitors. Yeah. I'd say one of the biggest things that helps people... Um, swap over from different services to, to our services it's always personality um, if you're working with someone which doesn't which is doing a good job but their personality just doesn't quite click with you and if you meet someone whose personality does click with you and they have a, a reasonable or good service you're more likely to go with them because of of that likability and you know you're gonna you're always gonna rub some people the wrong way you're not always gonna go on with everyone you can be professional with everyone we're not going to get along with everyone mm. and i do believe that if you can work with a select few people who have a, a, a good a good personality connection with you you can really make a good business on that which is where the referrals come in mm. kind of like going full circle you know mm. well you're talking about people buying people yes uh, and that work you know I don't know how many electricians in the company or the area, but country or the area, but there's like, there's thousands. Yeah. You, know, you, you go with that particular one up because they're either recommended and when they come, you've, you've got a good feeling about them. And, and quite often larger companies seem to think that's not the case, but even if you're tendering for larger companies, there's normally a particular person that you're dealing with. And that particular person, if they have a, a feeling for you, they're much more likely to go with you. So people definitely buy people. Um, and, and, and that's something not to be forgotten. I ex fully accept if you're food shopping like supermarkets, it's slightly different. But for most of us, that's how it is. Then again, you know, I'd say that I've seen it in Sainsbury's all the time. Not, not much anymore, but what it used to be is that you'd have people in, in aisles with a little kiosk saying free samples of food. And if I didn't like the tone or, or, or the, the physical attitude that someone had, their body language, I wouldn't approach them. They could be selling the nicest food and it's not great, but I, I just would not approach because it just don't seem friendly enough or that something about them just doesn't click. And I'm just like, oh, I don't think I trust you with that. Mm, don't. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just carry I mean, on. You, 
you are right. You, you go in your big supermarket and there's a, a particular person that you see once a week when you do your weekly shop and they're so nice to you every week and you, and you come out feeling good, you, you, you're naturally going to go back there every week yeah. as opposed to go somewhere else. Yeah. So, yeah, you're, de you're, you're definitely right. Yeah, spot on. In fact, a great example of this, um, I know that Aldi has some really, really good food and that they're really cheap because, you know, Aldi little stuff thing. And I shop in Tesco and there's Aldi and Tesco right next to each other. So it's, there's exactly the same difference. Aldi is cheaper, but I hate the service in Aldi. I hate how they just throw things at you and there's no time for a conversation with people. Mm. So I've made, I've made a couple of friendships in Tesco with these people talking to them. And I go back for that friendship. I go back for that personality. And I just, I, I really despise the sort of super efficient way that Aldi do things. And I know I'm a little bit more introverted, but when I'm out and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to speak to people because I've got this relationship with them, I want to have a conversation. I, I enjoy it. And, <laughs> You know, if, if I didn't want a conversation, I'd go for the self-checkout where I can do things at my own pace. I just don't yeah. bread yeah. thrown at your face, you know? <laughs> well, and for some people, that's the only only interaction they get, you know, for some, you know? Yeah. So it's important. So something I've been thinking about is procrastination. So I know a lot of, when I started, I had to do a lot of cold calling mm -hmm. and a lot of recalling of old prospects I haven't heard from a while. What would you? What advice would you give to someone who's uh, procrastinating picking up that phone? Um, that's a good question. Procrastination predominantly comes from fear. Something of fear that's happened may have happened to us in the past, or fear now. So, a lot of time it is. It could be the fear of rejection. So I'm picking up the phone to to make a. Um, a call that I, I just don't want them saying no to me because it's a sales call. Um, but it, procrastination develops itself in lots of different areas of business. So for, as a general rule, depend, not particularly in sales, but as a general rule, procrastination would help with any job broken down into small pieces, bite-sized lumps, as opposed to seeing the overall picture. So take anything back down to small pieces and get your mindset right and always remember how you felt after you've done the job whatever it is you're procrastinating how did you feel when it, you'd actually made that call and finished it was it a relief was it a good feeling the last time you did it and nine times out of ten it is because you didn't want to do it so now it's a good feeling so remember what it felt like last time and that'll help you moving forward with this time However, in terms of what we're particularly talking about, which is re-engaging with somebody, I don't know, from a quote or something. Firstly, um, this sh we should never be an issue because we should always have an agreed time for a catch-up. So for argument's sake, were you to be a client of mine, and this would apply whether I was an electrician, I was a business coach, I, whatever would be, okay, Ashley, thanks ever so much. Um, they are, I've, I've given you the details of, of everything. Perhaps we can have a catch up next Tuesday in the morning. How does that sound? Yeah. yeah. Okay, fantastic. 11 o'clock, good time? Yeah. I've walked out of that meeting, today's a Thursday for anyone who doesn't know, knowing that in four or five days time, I've got permission from you to call you. So it doesn't matter whether you remember on Tuesday, but I've got permission. So I feel okay in myself that it's not me pestering you. It was agreed. So when I phone you on Tuesday, I'm going to go, hi, Ashley, at 11 o'clock. Hi, Ashley. Kim here. As agreed, just following up from our last meeting last Thursday. Now I've got permission. That would help me stop the fear. Because part of the fear is one, the rejection that I'm not going to, they're going to say no. The second part is, am I pestering, am I pestering, am I pestering? Am I sounding too salesy? But if we've agreed a time, I'm not. That, get, that gets rid of that one. The second part is, depending on your business, for most of us, 
um, we tend not trying to to we cringe this paternity say we cringe when we give the price of our product or service and this will be trades people this would be most of us so when when it comes to it, oh, we might hide behind we have the meeting and then hide behind oh i'll send you the price in an email and then then we move on to the follow-up which becomes difficult however what we should be trying to do is you know initially in our, our meeting with somebody first we create the report or the rapport secondly we, we find out what they want what's their um outcome they want i'm trying to use broad brushes here because it's different for different industries for me it'd be slightly different but in a broad brush what what outcome do you want so if i was a tradesperson electrician i came into your presentation room and you say can we present in this room an awful lot um we're just finding you know the sockets are old we need um you know, we need the socks, sockets replaced. There's two ways to do that. I could go, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight sockets. There's 65 pound a socket. So that comes to, I don't know, 865, or whatever, you know, plus that. Or the better way, in my humble opinion. Okay, fantastic, Ashley. Can I ask you what you use this room for? Well, we do presentations and things. Oh, okay, and which end is most of your equipment at? Oh, it's at that end. Wouldn't you prefer to have more sockets at that end so you haven't got extension leads and things running across the floor, which are a little bit hazardous? Oh, you could do that. Yeah, rather than putting these ones down here that you don't use, we still leave one here rather than them three though. Why don't we put more sockets up that end, making it more useful? Oh, that'd be fantastic. Okay, it's £65 a socket, and then it's a little bit extra because we're moving, then that'd be another £50. Would that help you? Is that the sort of thing you want? Much better. Much better? With most people, and I, I will definitely say most now, will come in and go, a socket, £65 a socket. They will not ask you what you're using the room for. They won't ask you what outcome you want. The outcome is they just want to be able to plug their stuff in at the right end of the room so they can present properly without having leads all over the place and hazards. Without so if once I've given that to you, why would I then, except I'm not talking corporate deals here because that is different. Things do have to go through certain channels. But I'm just talking a general sort of lower end deal. Why would I go away and say, oh, I'll send you a quote? And then let it all go cold. Mm. Why wouldn't I just say to you at the end of that, no, that'd be fantastic. Okay, would you like to move forward with it? That momentum, keeping that momentum. momentum. Yeah, of course, Kim. Okay, we just signed this contract quickly. Da -da -da, we're done. We'll be in on next week to start fitting it if that suits you. Then and there, then you get rid of all that. But people are. are or can be very hesitant about giving a price face to face because it's the fear of rejection. And do you know how many times do you get someone, you get, you get to your point and you, you're going to give the price and because you think it's quite expensive, as you give it, you go, um, um, well, that would be a thousand pound, Ashley. And then I'm expecting you to go, oh yeah, fantastic. Now I'm just <laughs> giving it as if it's like the, the world. Rather than just saying, no, no you know, it, it comes to £999. There you go. Would you like to move forward with it? You know, always moving forward as opposed to, you know, so there's that. But having said that, if we have got to the point where we've not agreed a phone call, we've, we've, we've sent a price via email and we've had no acknowledgement, nice, easy way without feeling awkward would be to, for me to pick up the phone to you and go, Ashley, hi Ashley, it's Kim here from so-and-so, whatever. Um, we came around and priced up your job. I sent you an email last Friday. Can I just ask, did you, did you get the email? Because sometimes I know they don't, you know, not everybody reads them. What's the harm in that? Nice and easy. And the next question would be, oh yeah, got it. And you'll, you'll either say, you'll probably say, I haven't had time to read it, or yeah, I've read it. 
So if you hadn't had time to read it, I could say, um, okay, fantastic. I'll give you a time to read it. When would be a good time to call back to discuss it? Again, getting permission for the next phone call. Mm. Or, yeah, I've read it. Obvious next question. Have you got any, have you got any questions about the quote? And if they're still not, what did you think of it? Again, just trying to get, it's no harm if, you, if, we, if we hide behind something that we send out as a, in an email, there's no harm in engaging and saying, did you get the email? Mm -hmm. That's not pestering, that's just being professional because there's no guarantees they did get the email. The only thing you can guarantee is that you press the button that said send. Could have gone in a spam folder, could have gone in anywhere. So it's about how you re-engage with people. And some, sometimes, you know, I've, there was a wheel company I dealt with some while ago and um, he hadn't heard back from people for three months or four months. So still it, it, it was, it became procrastination because it became a difficult thing to pick the phone up again to re-engage. But again, it's just, no matter how long the period is, it's just, again, you know, hi, Ashley, Kim here. We, we spoke three months ago where we had a meeting and we were talking about doing a will for X, Y, and Z. You said you needed to speak to your children. I was just a quick catch up to see if that had happened yet. It, it's not salesy. And if you, if you all of a sudden turn around and go, yeah, I've spoken to him. Oh, okay. And what was the outcome of that? Can I ask? And, and it's just a question of finding out more information again. Mm. It's, um, but you've always got to look at when you're selling, what, what outcome do people want? And then how do you say that you can provide that outcome for them? And then shall we move forward? That's gen generally what I would say. There are in different fields, there's certain inferences in, in different areas we go. Um, because a lot of people will talk about the pain point. So in the, again, with the, um, with the electrician going into the presentation room, we could use with the pain point where they say, um, I've asked you whether you do more presenting up the other end and you say, I could ask you, well, what difficulties does it cause you down as it is at the moment? Oh, you wouldn't believe it. We've got extension leads going across the room. We've got, you know, can't find an extension lead half the time because their place hasn't got one, blah, 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 blah. So what would it mean to you if we could get this, you know, so everything's up there? Oh, that'd be fantastic. So it, it is, you know, you've got to work, you know, what, what, why do they want what they want? What trouble is it causing them at the moment? But actually picking up the phone shouldn't be an issue because it should have been arranged in the first place. So what would you say is the best advice to give someone that's making a cold call? Let's say, I mean, we, we met by a cold call. You know, we, we had a, a mutual point of connection, so it was quite easy. Um, but that, that initial, oh my God, I'm calling someone that I don't know. What's the best advice for someone to get over that? Okay. Well, having a mutual connection all, all of a sudden does take a lot of stuff away from a cold call because any sort of tiny bit of introduction isn't a cold call, but any cold call for me is, um, is not what I teach, but if it, if it's a cold call, when I'm trying to sell, um, that's not my arena. Mm. Okay. A cold call where we don't know each other and we're just trying to find out about each other would be more about, building a connection in terms of I'd be asking about you. There's two, let me explain two different ways, traditional sales and, and relationship sales. So relationship sales in effect is referral marketing. Traditional sales is what you're calling now, maybe, or one part of it, cold calling. Mm -hmm. If I cold call you now, I've never met you in my life. Let's say I, I'm selling, I'm leasing good vehicles. I cold call you now, I'll spend two minutes trying to create a rapport with you. Okay. Hi, Ashley. It's, it's Kim here from so-and-so leasing. Duh, 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 duh. Next minute, the next two or three minutes will be about identifying you've got a need. So I'll go, oh, oh Ashley. Okay. Uh, do you drive a car? 
yeah, what sort of car do you drive? Okay. Would you be interested in perhaps having a new one? Possibly at the right price. That's it. I've identified a need. The next 20 minutes is me trying to sell to you and overcome your objections. That, that's traditional sales. Because you'll be going, well, I can't afford that. Or, I don't really want that car. It's not the right, I'm not ready yet. And I'll be consistently trying to overcome all those objections for the next 20 minutes. Mm. So it's two minutes of rapport, three minutes of identifying a need, and 20 minutes of overcoming objections. All backwards, isn't it? All, all backwards, yeah. I mean, that's not the exact timings, but it's the percentage-wise yeah. of how, yeah. how it would go. In relationship marketing, marketing, again, it's not these time frames, but it's completely the opposite way. Yeah. It's firstly getting to know you, to trust you. That's the, and that's the big lump. That's the, the large, but the middle bit where it's not so big, but it would be, still be there, would be identifying the need. You know, so I know you, I know, you know, perhaps you've got a large family and you've been telling me your car's too small for your moment and you need a um, uh, people carrier or something. So, you know, I, I've known now that something from one of my suppliers has come on the market at a particularly good rate. So I know you're right for it. I then, um, now all I've got to do because of our relationship really is the very bottom bit of the triangle is let you buy. Because mm. I could just go, I'd, actually, I know you've got five kids. Um, you keep, you've been telling me for months now about your car. Then you're looking for something new. I'll tell you what, I've actually got a great deal come through on a, I don't know, uh, cruiser or something. Space yeah. cruiser. I'm making it. I don't know a lot about that. <laughs> That's why I don't sell cars. <laughs> a space cruiser. Um, <laughs> it's only £299 a month. I know you're paying 330 on what you've got now. And it's got all these mod cons sort of thing. I thought it'd be ideal for you. What do you think? Fantastic. That's not salesy at all. That's me no. solving a problem. Yeah. The, the two different triangles, the way we, we, we try it. Cold calling become, can become very frustrating. There's a lot of rejection. Mm. Absolutely. And uh -huh. one way to get around cold calling is to, even if, Somebody said, if I didn't know you, but I had a mutual acquaintance that knew you, that allowed me to use their name as an introduction, that all, all of a sudden breaks it slightly. It's not the same as complete referral, what we're talking about, but if you had a mate, but a mutual friend called Bob, when I phoned you, I could say, oh, uh, we've got a mutual friend, Bob, he's told me to give you a call. Straight away, we got a different conversation than we have if I'm just phoning you out of the blue and you don't know me. Mm. Something that I mean to ask you. So let's say that you we're, we're talking to someone for the first time um, and we're, we're warming them up. Um, not what we'll say, we'll say that exact same type of thing. We've um, a mutual connection, a mutual contact, and that we'll say it's over LinkedIn. We we'll, should we'll miss any messages. I am so terrible with small talk. I'm really bad at it. I think a lot of other people are quite bad at it as well. And it's about moving that conversation from a small talk perspective into a more serious business perspective. How do you do that? What is the most, what's the most effective way of, of moving the conversation from point A to point B and so on? Well, in fairness, you've, you've probably talked about me because I, I'm, I'm not great with small talk. I am very much to business, let's get it done. Mm. I'm, like everybody, I'm busy. So I'm, I'm on it, move it. Even, even with an email, it'll be, um, did you manage to do this? Did you manage? I have to stop myself to then put in the niceties. <laughs> I've got a good weekend, da, 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 because they're important. So my personality is also one of those that is, let's, let's move it on. But right. even, you know, on, on LinkedIn, even with the small talk, it, it's just questions. You know, so if you, you'd, the questions would be, so happy, happy, let's say I sent you a message this morning, because on LinkedIn, we always get things that give us notifications of people's birthdays. So I send you a message saying, happy birthday, Ashley. You send me a message back saying, thanks ever so much. I send you a message back 
saying, uh, no problem, it's a pleasure. Always ask a question now, how is business or how are you? Because they're, they're likely to respond to answer it. If I said, how are you? They're gonna ask about personally, how they are probably. So my next question, if I haven't already asked it, would be, how is business? Because most people that you and I deal with are business owners. Yes. It'd be different for somebody else. So how is business? And then that, they straight away, you've already moved it from in, in three short wordings from personal to business. Struggling a little bit at the moment. Um, everything's gone quiet because of COVID-19. Um, you know, we're, we're a little bit worried. Okay. Oh, I'm so, very sorry to hear that, Ashley. Um, tell me more about what you do. It should always be, which I know this conversation is not, because I'm doing all the talking because it's an interview. But <laughs> normally, it should be the opposite way around. If I was, was a potential client, it should be more or less the 2080 rule again. Mm. You do 80% of the talking and I do 20% 20, 20 of the talking. Mm. I do most of the listening. Mm. Um, and when that happens, what you say becomes exceptionally powerful because it's very limited. And people start to think about, well, what else does he know? You know, what, what insights could he give me? And all of a sudden you become very mysterious. And something I've tried very hard to try and curtail is the amount that I speak. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, good, I'm, I'm introverted, more in the middle, you know. Um, but I, look, I like to talk, I like to, I like to speak. And I realise that the more I say, the less valuable it is. Mm -hmm. Where you have to limit what you say, go slower, or go at the pace the person you're talking to um, and then think about what you want to say and say it very, very clearly, concisely and confidently. Like you yeah. said about the prices, you know, if, if, if someone says, how much is that going to be? Uh, 500 pounds? <laughs> um, it, it, it's not going to work. And um, recently I had to give a quote for um, video production, you know, doing someone's videos over LinkedIn and because it's so bespoke, and I normally put it with other things, um, I had no idea. I had no clue. I was like, well, you know, it, it, it normally it depends on other things and how big the video is. And, but, but they wanted a price. They were determined to get a price. So I just had to give them a price. I'm yet to figure out if that price is, is doable. But I'm committed to my quote. I'm committed to it. So because it's, it's my word and, and you learn these things as you go. Um, but it's, it's exceptionally interesting, exceptionally interesting. Silence is, is a wonderful tool. And um, I learned that many years ago from my police background, you know, when interviewing people, silence. So it, it's, a, if I ask you a question and I'm silent, you, you have the need generally to fulfill that silence. And if you answer it partly, and I'm still silent, you'll go deeper. If I'm still silent, you'll go deeper again. And the same thing you just went back, actually, and I should have said that earlier about pricing something, you went 500 pounds. What often we, if we're not completely comfortable about the price we're given, we then would do what you, you alluded to, oh, it's 500 pounds. And if they don't say yes immediately, within 10 seconds, well, I might have to do it for 400. You know, we don't even wait for the no or them to think about it. So even when you give your price in the other situation, again, go quiet, go silent. Yeah, that'd be 500 pound, actually. And then wait. And just, just wait, go. like that. Wait, because you know, part of it, they're just mulling it around in their head. Can I afford this? Yeah. Yeah, do I want it? Yeah. And you could find after 30 seconds, they come in, no, that's okay. Yeah. And there's always there's always the silent witness as well, isn't there? The the wife or the partner, business partner, someone else they're going to talk to. And one thing that I've tried with my coaching, because it's a high ticket item, is that I always try and create a proposal in a way that they can accurately relay back to the person to talk to. Because you know, how awkward is it if if you if you have a good session with someone, 
and they think this is a great prospect for me and they're really, really happy. And they go back and they talk to, the, to their wife or the business partner and they go, hold on a minute, this person is going to teach you how to sell to other people and refer you to other people. And he, he wants money for that. He, you know, and, he, and he's going to listen to you about your problems and he wants how, how, he wants how much for that? Like, I'll do that for you. I'll do it for you. And, and before you know it, the, all the, the gust has gone out, the sour's momentum is gone. But whereas if you can give a proposal, going, okay, so Kim, he's going to go through a five or four steps with me, which are trust, uh, basic business knowledge, identify the need for, for someone's services, an int- a proper introduction and appointment details, as well as many other aspects. And he's going to coach me about my business. Um, I really love talking to him. I think he's a fantastic guy. There's a hell of a lot more there than if you were, than if someone were to say, "Oh well, he's, he's going to talk to me a little bit, and uh, he's going to mm-hmm. present to me a little bit, and you know, I'm going to spend a few hours with him." Having that proposal there so that other people can talk about it is so so important. Because I think I think also you know, depending on what you're selling, mm-hmm. um, if, if there's more than one person that's making a decision on it. We should try and get them there at the same time as well, firstly. Um, and if they're not, for whatever reason, um, I would always say, if I was selling t- something to you now, Ashley, and, and you know, I would actually say, you go to me, well, I need to go away and speak to my other half or my business partner or whatever. Um, okay, I understand that. It's always feel, felt, found. Another thing that, that's, you know, I understand exactly. I, I, I did the same thing recently when I had some double glazing done. Um, in question for me, though, Ashley, would be um, if it was just your decision, can I ask you what it would be? The reason for that is if I'm relying on you going away and sell it to your business partner, if you're not convinced, I might as well forget it. Mm. But you, you, if you turn around and we get, no, I really want to do it. One, another good question would be, so, okay, so you really want to do it. Actually, let, let me ask you a question. So just to clarify some stuff for me, I want you to give me a one to 10 on how badly you want to do it. You know, a number 10 being like when you're drowning, you're underwater, you're trying to suck, get to the top so you can actually breathe again. That's a 10. What, what number would you say you're at? Anything between eight and above is good in my head. Yeah. So as soon as I'm thinking, okay, so you, you are serious about doing this. All right. Okay, actually, I'll tell you what, fantastic. I think we could work together. Um, might be a good idea if we, we book an appointment now. You're, what's your business partner name? Bob? Okay, Bob. Um, you speak to him and perhaps we can have a, a meeting on Friday afternoon, tomorrow afternoon. On Zoom again with Bob on, and then I can answer any questions for Bob as well. And you can, you know, you know us both, so you can facilitate. How's that sound? Great. Because I need to know where you're sat at. Because I don't want to get start. If I think, well, um, yeah, I think I'd probably quite like to do it. Then I realise I'm wasting my time. Mm. There's either a um, a hell no or a hell yes. And anything yeah. in between is, is worthless. We need a, a definite no or a definite yes. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, the, the, we, we do have to remember that, I mean, these are sales talks, but some people do buy differently. So some people do need a bit of time to process. So, you know, some people will buy immediately. Other people will say, okay, you know, I am interested. Just give me a couple of days to think about it. And we got to, we, the art of any sort of sales is identifying those people and the way their mind works. That no, if I try to push it now, I'm going to lose them. Mm. Um, but there are certain people that if you don't, you've lost them anyway because the whole ether, uh, the whole excitement of the meetings gradually diminishes as time goes on. But it, it, some people um, need a little bit longer. And also, the other point to remember, we, the people that normally are start asking us a few questions, don't start thinking they're the people that are just being awkward. Because nine times out of ten, they're the people that are actually interested. They actually want to find out more. 
Absolutely. Hmm. That's why you get, sometimes you get people that buy our products or services that you didn't think would because you thought they were anti or, or a little bit negative. And other people that you thought were so positive that sat there smiling, didn't say a thing, but looked so engaged. They never, they never engaged with you because they were just going through the motions. There's no definitive, but that can be the case what happens. Mm. Again, it comes back to personality, doesn't it? It comes back to how different people view the world and how, they, how their brain functions and all sort of good stuff. Yeah. Very interesting. Into mm. publicity. So, in terms of your um, way of, of using referral marketing to get to these, uh, get these clients and contacts, I, I suppose it's extremely, um, it's extremely down to empathy and understanding um, and building that rapport. So probably say empathy and rapport. Mm-hmm. What would you say are the best two ways to build empathy and rapport? Find commonality. So commonality would be, you know, in, in any conversation I have with people when I first meet them, um, obviously the, the, this is in different this we're talking about a numerous array of businesses types here so we're, we're generalizing again but i don't talk business with people originally uh, initially i talk about them so we'll have a meeting and i'll, I'll probably say to them um, hi ashley i said um tell you what i don't want to talk about business for the first 10 minutes just like to get to know you tell me about yourself tell them about your background what you like doing if you support any sort of teams, if you're into any sport, um, what's your passion? And then you start telling me about yourself. And then I'll find within that, we'll, we'll have some commonalities. So you, you may say, um, you know, I don't know, I, I love Italian food. Um, so, you know, in, in particular, I like, I don't know, risottos. And, and I'll say to you, well, what do you drink with that? What would you... Oh, I'll have a red wine. What sort of red wine would you drink with that? A Malbec. Okay, fantastic. And then I'm finding things. And then as we get through, I found out about you for 10 minutes and what your passion is, what you like doing. I can say, oh, you know, you said um, you support West Ham, which I know you probably don't where you are, but you know you said you support West Ham. I say, you know, I do as well. Do you go occasionally? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. And you know, you said you like red wine, Malbec. Malbec is my favourite red wine too. Did it? The more things I can find that we have in common, the rapport's starting. Mm. It's happening. And the other beauty side of that is, within referral marketing, that if I, if you started to give me some referrals that turned into business, I would know immediately how I could reward you, which I could take you out for an Italian meal, for you and me, we could, you could order what you like, I'll get us a bottle of Malbec, and you'll, you'll appreciate, you think, Kim really does know me. He's understanding, he's remembered that this is my favourite and blah, blah, blah. But also, I'm doing it with you. I'm building our relationship up even further. So that, that's how you build up the relationship and the commonality. Perfect. Just thinking now, I'd love to go to an Italian dinner with, uh, you know, with you, Kim. <laughs> love to. Maybe not the Malbec, but something else. <laughs> but we'll have to have a conversation about how I can refer people to you to get to this. Because you're down in London, so yeah. the restaurants there are much better than the one that I've got down here. <laughs> up here. So, uh, you know, a nice little, nice little trip down when all this is all over with. Careful what you're saying, you don't know who's listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyway, Kim, I, I realised that we are, um, we are getting on. So. Yeah. Is there, is there anything else that you want to add before we end this? Anything that you want to say and any parting words that you have? Only that, you know, we, we start in business, many of us, to, to, to find a better life. So don't get bogged down in it. Re-engage with why, what that better life looks like for you. Because it is possible. You know, it, it's... Um, many of us like to, it is about the freedom and the choices that being in business gives us. However, once we get consumed by the business, we actually often find we've got much less time than we would be if we was employed elsewhere. 
So try and work less in the business and more on it and the rewards will come a lot quicker. Fantastic. I can give them um, a great, great book recommendation for that actually. It's called The Power of Preeminence by Paul Rawkins. Fantastic book on that, working on the business instead of in the business. And I know that you do exceptional work on that as well. Exceptional work on that. But yeah, thank you for joining me today. It's been fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I'm sure that loads of people are going to get um, a lot of value from this conversation they've had. And I certainly have. I've learned a hell of a lot that I didn't know before. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed it too. I have, Ashley. Thank you ever so much for inviting me. No problem. See you soon, Kim. See you later, mate. Bye.